for uh, inviting us and for allowing us to share our social determinants of health series. I'm going to share my screen now and allow Adrian to begin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrian Neff. I'm very happy to be here with you this afternoon to discuss ways that you can assist your patients with obtaining and maintaining their safe, affordable, and stable housing. And I want to thank you all in advance for the work that you do on behalf of your patients. So a little bit about us at Legal Health. We are the largest medical legal provider in the country. We currently um, work at 36 hospital-based sites. And we just celebrated our 20th anniversary of service. Um, and we have a lot of exciting work going on and going forward. We are housed within New York Legal Assistance Group, which is a um, which provides the free legal services to low-income New Yorkers. We can assist with all civil legal issues. We just do not help with tax law or criminal matters. Okay, so we have five training objectives for this afternoon. The first is to give an overview of the different types of housing that your patients might live in and the assistance that is available to them. And we're specifically going to be focusing on um, immigrant tenants as well as updates on what's happening with COVID-19. We're going to give um, instructions for how tenants can report conditions in their apartments. We'll give an overview of eviction prevention measures that are available. We'll go over what happens in housing court and um, what your patients can do to protect their rights in housing court. And then finally, we'll look at the different uh, resources that are available to help them improve or stabilize their housing. So as an initial matter, we see a strong connection between housing and health, both physical and mental. And um, the three areas that we see that most affect people's health are the areas that we're gonna be looking at at our training today. So the first is the quality of the home and particular the conditions within the home, the building that might be affecting their health. Next, we'll look at the security of the housing. So whether they're able to afford their housing, whether they're having to reallocate resources away from medicine or food. And so what additional resources might be available to contribute towards their ability to pay rent. And then finally, um, the issue of homelessness. So how homelessness can affect individuals both with the conditions in the shelter and how the stress really of all of these different domains can um, negatively affect people's health. So going a little bit deeper into those domains, we see housing as a really um, strong determinant of health. So just to go a little bit deeper into those three areas, poor housing conditions can contribute to disease, injuries, and poor childhood development. The housing insecurity can affect people's ability to get treatment. They might be more likely to not see their doctor, as I said, to not um, take their medicines and to rely on emergency room just for treatment. And then finally, homelessness, which we try really hard to avoid with our patients, um, can, can lead to readmission to the hospital and also contribute to poor health. So um, taking this a little bit further, we see housing not just as a social justice issue, but as a racial justice issue. So overall, uh, the income and social inequalities that we see within society contribute to housing inequality as well. So um, Black and Latinx folks might be more likely to live in low income and overcrowded and rundown housing. So for example, um, for Section 8 residents, we see 48% of households are um, Latinx or Black American. Um, and then we see often within those housing, and that includes NYCHA as well, that conditions such as mold, lead paint, and infestations can um, be more prevalent in those types of housing and can adversely affect the health. And then it becomes a negative cycle as um, housing and health are affected. So the first question that we always want to figure out when we're assisting a patient with their housing issue is what type of housing they live in. So there are lots of different possibilities and the rights and the procedures might be different based upon what system they're navigating. So the most common that we see are NYCHA. A patient might also live in what we call a, a private 
housing. So that might be a large corporation or it might be um, a family or an individual. It might be regulated or it might be unregulated. So it's really important to figure that out as well. There are other forms of subsidized housing in addition to Section H, so HUD, Mitchell Lama, HPD, or tenant-owned buildings or co-ops. And then finally, the Department of Homeless Services shelter system. Okay, so um, our patients, our clients deal with a lot of different systems. Some, some of them interact, some of them are separate. And these systems have gotten even more complicated Due to COVID-19, um, often offices are closed, so patients cannot go in person, have to try to access the services through the web, which they might not have access to. So we've seen an additional inequality emerge through the technology gap that as advocates, we can provide assistance with by um, accessing those resources and helping the patients navigate them. So a couple, there's a lot of acronyms up here, a couple that I wanted to break down a little bit that are really important. On the right side, you will see HPD, which stands for Housing Preservation and Development. This is a city agency that often deals with the conditions in the apartment. So we'll be talking about them a lot in this training. Lower down on the right, you see DHCR, which is a state agency, stands for Division of Housing and Community Renewal. And um, that deals more with generally with rent issues, can also deal with conditions in some situations. And then on the left side for public assistance, um, the agency that we deal with most there is HRA, Human Resources Administration. So they can help not only with public assistance, food stamps, but also with rent assistance. Um, so some of the patients are very familiar with these different organizations. Some might be new and really overwhelmed with trying to figure out how they work. So the first substantive area we're going to discuss is the quality of housing. So what are the conditions that your patients and their families are living in? The first thing that's really important to understand and for all tenants to understand is that um, all tenants have a right to habitable housing under New York State and city law regardless of their immigration status. So there is an obligation on the part of any landlord to ensure that the building is safe, clean and well-maintained. Um, and there is what's called an implied warranty of habitability in every apartment situation. Um, so it cannot be contracted around. The landlord can't put anything in a lease that says that it doesn't have to be habitable. Um, and it, and they don't, there doesn't have to be a lease for this to be the case. I think we have a poll here, if I'm right. <laughs> okay, we have our first poll. It's anonymous, it's not a quiz. It's just to make sure that um, you're on the same track as we are. So the first is, um, what's the question? <laughs> so the question is, and I think it'll pop up, um, is what kind of uh, conditions might render a dwelling uninhabitable? So in this poll, which should pop up soon, um, you'll be able to list where you've seen and maybe in apartments firsthand with patients, what types of uh, things occur in the home that might make it uninhabitable. So please list everything that you might think. Um, this question is actually an open answer question. So um, we would love if everyone could list things in the chat box. Um, Simone, would you be able to repeat the question and put it in the chat Absolutely, box? and I'll put it in the chat box. Okay, we already have one. What makes a dwelling uninhabitable? Great, so far we've got lots of great answers. Pests, mold, no heat, no stove, lack of heat, hot water, collapsed ceilings, lead poisoning, absolutely lack of plumbing, water leaks, lack of ventilation, heat, hot water, Really, really, really great answers. No water, rodents, elevator service, interesting one. Cold, yep, leaks, mold, no air conditioning, questionable, but we can get to that. Foundation issues, pests, rodents. All right, these are all really great and we can go through. You've all answered really great. So we'll move on, Adrian. So the most common conditions that we see, um, Roach or rodent infestation, mold, lack of heat and hot water. 
uh, lead-based paint, and then peeling paint or plaster. And as someone indicated, I think in the chat, this can often be the results of um, a leak, a water leak, either from the apartment above. Um, so there is an obligation on the part of the landlords and multiple dwellings to repaint the apartment every three years. Um, so other, I think, I know some people mentioned a uh, missing stove. That's a really important one. We do see a lot. Um, cracked floors can be an issue, right? They can be a trip hazard or can lead to splinters. So there are a lot of different conditions that might exist in the apartment. Um, and we do see, unfortunately, that another impact of COVID is that the, there's been much less willingness on the part of landlords to make these repairs. So during the worst period last year, many landlords were, and including NYCHA were refusing to enter apartments at all. So now we see a real backlog in repairs um, and a lot of advocacy is often required to get those landlords to make those needed and um, legally required repairs. So um, we want to highlight in specifically the lack of heat and hot water. Um, so this time of year, this always becomes an issue. And so there's a very clear rule on heat, specifically between the months of October and the end of May. So during the day, if it's fit, uh, below 55 degrees outside, the temperature inside must be at least 68 degrees. And at night between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., there's no requirement for the outside temperature. Um, it must be at least 62 degrees inside. And hot water is required year round. But this is a very clear rule for what's required on the part of landlords during those months. Um, okay. So the rights that we identified, everyone has a right to habitable housing, includes undocumented tenants. Um, and there's a special rule there that um, it's illegal for landlords to harass tenants based on their immigration status. So we do see this, unfortunately, where landlords are saying, you know, if you don't pay your rent, I'm going to call ICE or putting fear in them that if they take, if the, if the tenant takes the landlord to court, then ICE might show up. Um, so that's considered a, a form of harassment and should be reported. So there are different agencies that it should be reported to based on the type of apartment. For a rent regulated apartment, so that's rent stabilized or rent controlled, they should contact DHCR. For a non-regulated apartment, big regulated apartment, they should call the City Human Rights Commission. Um, and either in either case, they can also contact the Attorney General's office to report that harassment. Okay, so special situations that we see where people are sometimes unclear on whether these rights apply to them. So we already covered immigration status, but a, another issue where they might not be sure if they're protected is if they have a month to month rental, they might not have a lease, it might just be a verbal agreement. So that is a legal tenancy and um, the landlord has an obligation to keep it habitable. Um, they should understand though that with this type of housing, the landlord can end the tenancy. So there has to be a notice and they do have to take them to court but um, they don't have as much protection in terms of stability as a rent regulated tenant, but they still have that right to habitable housing. And the second example is one we often see in um, Queens and Brooklyn, Brooklyn, where um, people might be living in a basement, it might be an illegal apartment. So in that case, the warranty of habitability still applies. It doesn't matter that the apartment itself is illegal. If someone is living there, it still has to be habitable but it gets a little complicated because the tenant should be advised that they might have to move. There might be a vacate order issued by the city. So in that case, they should speak to an attorney if possible to figure out what their rights are um, because there's, there's really no um, obligation to pay rent. The landlord can't charge them rent technically, but they also don't have a lot of stability in that situation. So it can get a little bit tricky. Um, okay, so you, if we identify a patient, they have bad housing conditions, what can they do to improve the situation? So the first is that they understand that connection between the housing conditions and their health. So they might be missing appointments, as we said, they, their asthma or their children's asthma might be getting worse. And so it's a pretty, it can be a pretty urgent situation that needs to be addressed immediately. The first step is to identify who the landlord is. So this can be sometimes a little bit difficult, especially with these large corporate landlords 
where they're often buildings are changing hands frequently. Um, so that information might be on a lease. You can also use a tool that we'll be um, talking about throughout the presentation called justfix.nyc. So if you enter the um, address of the building, the landlord will pop up. It'll tell you what other buildings they own. And it'll also list violations. So that's if they're not sure who their landlord is, um, you want to make sure you get that information because oftentimes people will say, well, I told the super, you know, or I told Betty down at the office, but you want to make sure that it's in writing, that it's officially addressed to the landlord. Um, the first step is to make a complaint in writing to the landlord. Um, and oh, did I jump ahead? Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, we'll go, we'll go on. Um, okay, so the first. So uh, this is another place where JustFix has a tool called a letter of complaint tool, where they will actually send the letter certified mail to the landlord. Um, so that's a really nice online tool that can help or the, the tenant can do it themselves. They can just let the landlord know exactly what the problems are, how long they've been there, just so that they're putting the landlord on notice. If the landlord doesn't respond, they just make the repairs. The next step is to call 311. Um, and in cases like a lack of heat or hot water, they can call every day that there's not heat or hot water. So even if they've already made that complaint, it's important to keep um, identifying those issues. So someone from HPD will come to inspect. They should make sure that they include all the problems so that those are included in any violation report. Um, and then that report will be sent to the landlord. And when HPD comes, if they consider the situation hazardous, they will possibly um, make the repair themselves and bill the owner. So it's really important that that initial call be made to HPD. Sometimes people feel like nothing's gonna happen, but it's important to follow all these steps in case litigation does become necessary. Um, and there's a little bit of a different procedure for NYCHA. NYCHA has a customer contact center that the tenant has to call to report the condition and to request the repairs. So it's often called a ticket number. Um, NYCHA will sometimes just go ahead and close them without having made the repair. So um, it's important people have a, an open ticket and um, there is a self-service portal that's online that they can use if they do have the capacity to check on the status of their ticket numbers. And in particular with mold and lead, there has been litigation that requires immediate um, remediation on the part of NYCHA. So once the, there is an open ticket, we can help um, or you can help if you are assisting the patient with advocating with their management office to get those repairs. So in a perfect world, the landlord would go ahead and make the repairs once they've been put on notice, but unfortunately we find that that does not always happen. So the tenant can bring their landlord to court. Most of housing court is devoted to eviction proceedings where tenants are the defendant, but in the HP part, the tenant is actually the plaintiff. Um, and it's it can be difficult to get a lawyer to help, but the, these proceedings are very tenant friendly. There's a lot of assistance within the court, so they can actually do this on their own. Um, and we have provided the site where they can begin that process. Once they, they bring what's called an HP, HPD is a party to the case and will come to make the inspections, violations will be issued, and then the court can issue what's called an order to correct, mandating the landlord to make those repairs and if necessary, order fines and civil penalties. Um, there's also a NYCHA HP in every housing court. And um, for a while they were just taking emergency HPs, but now they're doing all matters. So once all the prior steps have been taken, the landlord has been put on notice, HPD has come. If necessary, they can bring an HP in housing court. So we're gonna do our first case study. Um, this is Margarita, it's a very common scenario. So she's the mother of four young children. Uh, Margarita is undocumented and she and her children all have severe asthma. They live in a basement apartment, there's no lease um, and it's questionable whether the apartment is legal. There are a few windows, roach and rodent infestation and dust from the boiler that's located nearby. 
They receive treatment at the hospital, um, but her children still have to visit the ER often and they have severe asthma attacks. So three questions here. First, does Margarita have a right to habitable housing? Second, what steps can Margarita take to improve her housing? And finally, does it matter that Margarita is undocumented? So everybody should see the three questions come up on a poll. Um, if you don't, please say so in the chat. <laughs> then we'll give people 10 more minutes to answer. Um, sounds like people, can somebody else weigh in? Can you see the poll on the screen? No, you, we, okay. You don't see the results, just, you should just, yes, thank yeah. you, see the three poll. Questions. Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone who chimed in. So the first question, yes, absolutely. Margarita has a right to habitable housing. It does not matter that she doesn't have a lease. It doesn't matter the apartment might be illegal. But you still have that same right. What steps can Margarita take to improve her housing? Um, so this one, I think there was supposed to be an all. <laughs> I think there's supposed to be an all question, an option. Um, but all of these are right, so everybody was correct. So first, they should report the conditions in writing. If that doesn't work, call 311. And then finally, possibly bring an HP. And then the final question was, um, does it matter that the mom is undocumented? It absolutely does not. Her immigration status has no effect on her tenancy rights. Thank you, everyone. So an additional measure that can um, you can assist with at any point during this process is to help the patient to obtain a letter from their doctor describing how the condition in the apartment or the building is impacting their health of the patient. So again, in a perfect world, a landlord would be very moved by this evidence and would urgently make the repairs. If that doesn't work, it can be strong evidence to present in housing court. The judge will find it very persuasive and um, hopefully address the urgency of the matter. Um, so we know how busy our doctors are and um, any help that can be provided in getting these letters. We also have samples and templates that can um, assist with letting them know exactly what should be included in that letter. All right, so our key takeaways from this initial session on housing quality. So first of all, we see that poor housing conditions can impact health, that um, there are a lot of rights that tenants have and you can help to empower them to take action. You can educate your patients to help them know that they have a right to healthy housing. And the tools that are available are 311 or the NYCHA call center there are protections against harassment. There are also tools for enforcing those protections. And they can also be referred to legal services where we can assist with um, improving the quality of their housing. So the next area that we're going to discuss is on eviction prevention and specifically the changes that have happening and are constantly happening due to COVID-19. So we see a lot of different ways that housing security shows up with our patients. The first is that they might be behind in rent and worried about possibly being evicted. They might have gotten papers from the court and are very nervous about having to appear. They might actually be in housing court and might not have a lawyer, might be confused about what they need to do. They might be living or have lived with someone who was on the lease who died or moved and if they themselves are not on the lease, they might not know if they have the right to stay in the apartment. And lastly, they might be a month to month tenant and not sure if they are also protected. Um, so we have very strong tenants rights here in New York. And regardless of whether there is a lease, if someone has lived in a home for over 30 days, the landlord cannot throw the tenant out or change the locks. It doesn't matter if they haven't paid rent in months. There is no self-help eviction allowed in New York State. So um, 
it's very important for tenants to understand that, that sometimes people are afraid that if they get something from the landlord or from the court, they're gonna be evicted the next day. And most landlords, especially the large corporate landlords know about this, but we do see, unfortunately, some smaller landlords don't, they might think they can get away with this, but it's very illegal um, to just evict someone. So that can't happen. And if it does, they should call the police and they should contact a lawyer right away. So the protections are even stronger for people who are in rent regulated or section eight apartments. So um, for those situations, even beyond the lease that they have signed, there is a right to stay in the apartment unless certain conditions, um, violations of the lease take place. But sometimes people's lease will expire and they'll be nervous, but if they're rent regulated, they can stay. Um, so very important for everyone to understand that the landlord must take them to court, get a final judgment and order of eviction from the court. So only a judge in housing court can order them out of their home. No one should just up and leave because they're behind in rent or because the landlord is saying they're going to evict them. And especially now due to COVID-19, this can take a long time. Um, so sometimes people need just need more time to get the money together or to apply for different forms of assistance. They will have time. Um, and they should not uh, worry that they're just going to be kicked out onto the street. They will have seen a judge and go through a long process before they're at any immediate threat of eviction. So only a city marshal can evict a tenant and they must get notice as well. Um, it's called a marshal's notice. So in that case, if they are at that stage, they should be in touch with a lawyer. Um, marshals are not currently evicting anyone, so this shouldn't be happening, but um, it's just important to know what those different stages are and that only the last one where there's a marshal's notice is a real immediate um, emergency. So there's been a lot of changes due to COVID. There are protections. Um, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to figure out which protections apply to whom. And um, some of these also require that action be taken by the tenant. So for a while we had a moratorium where no one was going to court, no one was being evicted. Those have, that's been loosened a little bit. There is still a moratorium in place until January 15th, 2022. Um, but there is action that needs to be taken by the tenant. So I'll go into that. There's also the Emergency, emergency Rental Assistance Program or ERAP, which is available. We'll talk about that. Um, there are, the courts are not issuing defaults and there is a right to counsel, and there's also the Safe Harbor Act. So we'll talk about all those in turn, starting with the moratorium. Um, so this is called CIFPA, and it has been extended until January 15th, 2022. Um, unlike before, where it was automatically applied across the board to everyone, there is now a requirement that the tenants show hardship, that they've been affected by COVID-19 or that being evicted could have a negative impact on their health. So there is a, a two-page document called a hardship declaration. It's, in, it's available in several different languages. And um, there, there are two different options. So one is that they have lost income due to COVID-19. Um, and the second is that, the other option is that they are disabled or someone in their home is elderly and so they would be negatively affected by that eviction. Okay, so jumping ahead to the hardship declaration and ERAP. So the hardship declaration must be submitted um, either to the landlord, so if they're just behind in rent and they haven't gotten anything from the court, they can send it to their landlord, they should send it certified mail if possible so that there is a record of it. Um, you know, again, don't just hand it to the super or someone in the office. You want to have proof that has been submitted. If they're already in court, if they've received a petition or they have an ongoing matter, they can submit it directly to the court. So if this has been submitted, they should not be in court unless the landlord has chosen to challenge the hardship declaration. So if the landlord has a basis to say they haven't actually lost income or they won't be affected, they can bring a case and there will be a hearing um, but the tenant can ask for an attorney to represent them in that matter. So they should go ahead and file that. And um, we haven't seen, I haven't seen that happen at all, but it can happen. Um, the other, so one way that, that the proceeding can be delayed is by submitting that hardship declaration. So they automatically should then 
not have any court matter until January of next year. The other is to apply for ERAP. So um, the good thing about ERAP is that it not only pays the, any back arrears, but it also puts a hold on that housing case. So that's a defense in housing court that they have applied for ERAP and that the court should wait until they get a decision on their application before going forward with the non-payment proceeding. And the other benefit is that um, the landlord cannot sue them for one year if they accept that money. Um, and a special um, exception with this, with this particular form of assistance is that immigration status does not matter. Everyone can apply. That's not always the case with some forms of rent assistance. So particularly for our undocumented patients, this is a really important tool to have. Um, and applications are still open. We don't know how much longer they're going to have money available. So if they haven't applied yet, they should apply as soon as possible. So that's the moratorium. Um, there's also the ongoing safe Har Tenant Safe Harbor Act, which says that um, individuals cannot be evicted for non-payment of rent. So they can get a money judgment issued against them. It's, that's in a separate court proceeding. It's not in housing court. Um, and so depending on their income, what form of income they get, um, that money judgment might affect them differently. So they should speak with an attorney or a financial counselor if they get that form of case brought against them because those are going forward um, and it depends on their situation if a money judgment is going to hurt them financially or not. So a lot of times a uh, patient will come to us with eviction papers, right? And they'll be very nervous. So it's really important to figure out what those papers are because it will determine where they're at in the housing court um, procedure and how urgently and how what type of action needs to be taken. So the first document that they might receive will be from their landlord. Um, and it usually is a letter that is either a rent demand if the issue is non-payment of rent or a notice to terminate if it's uh, if the lease is ending and the landlord wants them to leave. Um, so if they get this letter, it's it's just the what's called the predicate notice. So it puts them on notice that a um, proceeding is likely to begin, but they shouldn't panic at this point. It's just, um, it's, helpful and it can be used to apply for ERAP as well if they have the total amount that they owe. The next step is where a case has actually started in court and they'll receive a summons and petition. Um, so they should file what's called an answer. So this is sort of a term of art in housing court and uh, where they list any defenses that they have to the non-payment of rent. So that can be conditions in the apartment can be a defense if they paid some of the rent um, and that hasn't been credited they can go ahead and um, include that. Um, can you go back, sorry, to stage of, of eviction because there are different pages. So if they have an actual court date, um, they should make sure to appear. Those are still happening virtually. So if they have those um, issues with technology, um, you should try to get them in touch with an attorney or help advocate for them. And if it's the first court appearance, um, they should appear and ask for an attorney. So I think this is a little bit of a stronger right to counsel here. The judge should um, give them an attorney and often that person will appear at that first hearing. And then the final piece of paper, it would be that marshal's notice. So that is urgent. Um, they do need to take action immediately and have a lawyer helping them if they don't already. So the first type of eviction proceedings is for non-payment of rent. And this is where um, the tenant will receive what's called a rent demand, stating the amount that's owed, all the months that weren't paid, and giving them a specific time in which they have to pay. So even though there's a date on there, it doesn't mean that if they don't pay the rent by that date, they have to leave. It just means that if that date passes, there will likely be a case brought against them in court. Um, that initial letter notice is a rent demand. And as we said, they can answer um, by calling the clerk. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
and they have defenses to the non-payment. So our habitability issues, they might've paid part of the rent if HRA is supposed to be paying um, or section eight, those can also be defenses to the non-payment. The other type of eviction proceeding is called a holdover. So this means that the lease period, if there was a written lease or just a verbal agreement has ended and the tenant has stayed past the end of the lease. Um, the predicate notice in this case is called a notice to terminate. And it'll also give a date by which they have to leave. Again, they should not leave by that date. They still have to be taken to court. Um, there can still submit a hardship declaration and it might be the part B option if they have someone who's disabled or elderly in the, in the apartment. Um, and these are generally on hold. There are nuisance cases going forward, um, but sometimes those are really just a cover for a non-payment or the landlord is just angry with the tenant. Um, so it does have to be an actual nuisance that's being done by the tenant. And again, they should, if that does happen, if there's a nuisance case against them and they have a court date, they should ask for an attorney at that first appearance. Okay, so we have our next case example and poll, another common scenario. Um, so Lucia is mom of a young child. Her daughter has a leukemia and mom has to go to all of her appointments with her. The mom is undocumented and she's having a hard time keeping up with bills. She lost work due to COVID-19 and she also has to go with her daughter to medical appointments. So she has about $6,000 in arrears. She's very worried that they're gonna lose their apartment, be placed in a shelter, which will have a negative impact on her daughter's health. She gets papers from the landlord and she's really nervous. Um, she feels like she's gonna be evicted. She's gonna be out the next day. So the questions for Lucia are, does it matter that she's undocumented? And what can you do to identify what stage of eviction she is in? Hopefully everyone was able to see the polls and is able to answer them and give it a couple more seconds. Okay, great. So we have our responses. So the first question, does it matter that she's undocumented? Absolutely does not matter. She can, um, all of these protections apply to her and she should take the actions necessary to ensure that she is protected. So what can you do if she comes to you and says she has his eviction papers to help her figure out where she is in that process? Um, so you can read through her papers to see what kind of notice it is. Um, you can go on eCourts um, or NYSCF to see if there's an upcoming court date or you can call the clerk um, and ask if she has a lawyer. So all of these can be really helpful to figure out what, where she is in the process. So in the event that Lucia does not have a lawyer yet, there are still things that she can do and that you can assist her with to make sure that she is protected. The first is to submit that hardship declaration to the landlord. And remember that um, this can be challenged by the landlord. There will be a hearing and the tenant will have a right to ask for an attorney at that hearing. So if the hardship declaration applies, um, they will be safe from eviction to at least January 15th, 2022. She can apply for ERAP if she has not already. It can be for the months that she fell behind and um, up to three months going forward. So in addition to paying off those arrears and it is a grant, it's not a loan that has to be repaid. That application itself will pause any eviction proceeding until there's a decision on the application. Um, and just as a reminder, it does not matter that she's undocumented. She can submit the hardship declaration. She can apply for ERAP and she will be 
um, given a lawyer in court, even if she does not have immigration status. Um, so we talked about answer. So again, this is a term of art. It's a response to the summons and petition. Um, and currently the best way to respond is to call the clerk. So the numbers for each borough are listed here. Um, they can go in person, but we're really discouraging people from going to the courthouse if it's not necessary. So what will happen is the clerk will ask them the questions on the form and they wanna make sure that the answers are correct. Um, and they don't have to worry that this is perfect or be nervous that they're not answering things correctly. There will be an opportunity once they have a lawyer to amend that answer. If they're not sure if some of these apply or not and they're afraid of making any kind of false statement, they can just um, indicate a general denial and that will be a sufficient response for now. Okay, so just to review how you can help Lucia in this situation, you can go over her paperwork with her to figure out what stage of housing court proceedings she's at, if any, and if she has received papers from the court, how to file an answer with the clerk. You can help her submit a hardship declaration and apply for ERAP if she has not already. And um, we can refer her to legal services for any additional advice and possible representation. The last area that we're going to cover is on rental assistance and subsidies that are available, are available for people who are having difficulty paying their rent. So the first is ERAP, which we've discussed. Um, so this should be the initial application while those um, funds are still available. And then if the person doesn't qualify for ERAP or once those, that money is gone, there is rental assistance from HRA, which is often referred to as a one-shot deal. Your patient might also be eligible for a voucher, um, which is a subsidy that will um, pay part of their rent, depending on their situation. If they are elderly or disabled, they might be eligible for SCREE or DRE, which are rent freeze programs. Um, if they have HIV or AIDS, they might be eligible for HACCP. And then finally, there's Project Parachute, which is available for undocumented individuals who might not qualify for some of these other programs. So first, we're gonna talk about SCREE and DRE. Um, so it's important to understand that this is a rent freeze. It's not a subsidy, um, but it does stop the rent from increasing further in the future if they qualify. So the requirements are that they have to um, live in a rent stabilized or rent controlled apartment um, or certain kinds of co-op. They can also be eligible for SCREE. They must be 62 or older with an income of 50,000 or less and the rent must be at least one third of their income. So a similar program is available for disabled individuals. Um, they must live in rent controlled, rent stabilized, or at some kind of co-op. At least 18 years of age, income of 50,000 or less, rent as one third of their income, and they must be awarded some sort of disability benefit. So it can be SSI, SSD, or veterans. Okay, so the one-shot deal available through HRA, those are not currently being processed, HRA is directing people to ERAP, which is um, being, those applications are being handled by a different state agency. Um, but if they, as we said, if, they're, if they don't qualify for ERAP, so for instance, if they live in a co-op, they can apply through Access HRA. Um, and so this is not a subsidy or ongoing assistance. It's a one-time payment for arrears. Um, and there are important requirements that HRA will make sure that they meet. They have to, um, the housing has to be affordable. So they have to be able to pay the rent going forward. And they'll look at the reasons that the person fell behind in rent and any risk factors. Um, a one-shot deal is a loan. And so it might have to be repaid depending on the individual's income. Um, so this is again why ERAP is a better option because it is a grant. They might also have to get charity money to kind of pay down the arrears in order to be considered for a one shot. So that's something that a social worker attorney can help with. Um, and as we said, these can be uh, good for co-ops where ERAP is not currently an option. 
Um, so HASA, as we said, is another subsidy that's available through HRA for individuals living with AIDS or who are HIV positive. Um, so they get, I think there's cash assistance available and there's also a rent subsidy. Um, so they, the individual will pay 30% and the rest of it will be paid by HASA. So this is a really strong, helpful program for individuals who qualify. And then another option that people might be eligible for are a voucher. So if someone is in an apartment and is not able to afford it, or if they are in a shelter and are looking for affordable housing, they should make an appointment with Homebase. So Homebase can evaluate them for eligibility for a voucher. Um, the link on here identifies the different home base sites, which are based on zip code, so they can check and see where, where they live and call the appropriate office. So one option is they might be eligible for FEPS. This is for families. There used to be a requirement that they were in court. I think they've loosened that during COVID. Um, so they can receive assistance for up to $9,000 in arrears and also a dis assistance going forward. And then city FEPS is similar, but it's um, a supplement for individual for also help individuals to help them find and keep housing and that's an option if they're in the shelter system and home base also um, issues project parachute benefits which are for undocumented families who might not qualify for some of these other programs we have our final case study and poll lydia is uh, 75 years old she has a fixed income she suffers from epilepsy and diabetes. Her income is 761 and her rent is 745. So she uses almost all of her um, income to pay her rent. Her apartment is rent stabilized, but she's worried about having to, enough money to pay when her lease is up and renewed and there's um, likely gonna be a rent increase. She's also fallen behind in rent. She gets food stamps, but she's not eligible for public assistance. So our poll question is just one, what rental assistance is available to Lydia? So is she eligible for a SCREE or DREE, ERAP, housing voucher, or all of the above? Have our results. So um, she can apply for SCREE and DRE. She can apply for ERAP. Um, she can meet with Homebase to see if she might be eligible for a voucher. So the correct answer is D, all of the above. Um, so in conclusion, these are our key takeaways addressing our learning objectives. So first of all, it's essential to understand that all tenants have a right to habitable safe housing regardless of their immigration status, and they can assert those rights in court. Um, no tenant should leave their apartment unless there's a court order from a judge and um, a marshal's notice has been issued and they should report any harassment on the part of the landlord to the proper agency. There are many eviction pre prevention protections that are in place but they do require action on the part of tenants. So it's important to not sit back and assume that nothing is gonna to happen to, till January, 2022. They wanna make sure that they've submitted that hardship declaration and applied for ERAP if they're eligible. What you can do to assist them is to help them identify what stage of the eviction proceeding they're in and um, to help them address those fears and also empower them with the rights and also um, the procedures, understanding what's gonna happen in the future. And finally, there are many rental assistance resources available for vulnerable tenants from the city and the state to stabilize their housing situations. Um, so we have about 20 minutes available for questions. I know that there's been a lot of activity in the chat. Thank you so much, Adrian. 
I'm going to, while people maybe have questions, we've had so many amazing questions here and there's been a lot of overlap. So I just wanted to address a few. Um, firstly, there was an excellent ERAP presentation given um, recently with the Brooklyn Health and Housing Consortium. Tess Summer has put it in the chat. It will likely be sent out with this presentation. It's on YouTube. And so all ERAP questions um, can be probably answered there. It's very complicated. And our general advice is if they haven't applied yet, they must apply now because um, it gives them protection, even if they're kind of confused about whether or not they're covered. It gives them the protection and housing court of not being evicted until there's a decision on their case. Um, there's been a few questions just about how to prove that you are a tenant. And this is really important. And Adrian talked a lot about undocumented tenants, especially being vulnerable to this. Um, even if they don't have a lease, what we generally advise is to show any proof whatsoever that they have a rental obligation, right? That means that they have been um, in the apartment for a certain amount of time. They play, pay with a money order. If they pay with cash, please admonish them to stop doing that and to pay with a money order always. They have Venmo transactions. They have WhatsApp. You know, we go through, you know, we are lawyers, so we build evidentiary proof that they have a rental obligation. So they shouldn't not apply because they're worried about not being able to prove it. Yes. Um, and so questions, first question is, um, can they apply for ERAP? Yes. And it's important, as Adrian pointed out, that they do apply because undocumented families, um, if they're mixed status, can apply for one-shot deals. Um, but they cannot by themselves, if they're undocumented, apply for one shots, which is why the ERAP program is kind of one of one of a kind. Um, someone that has put forward their experience with home base are not very good. Well, they're doing their best. <laughs> I think there's some home base folks here who would uh, take issue. But um, the issue is that there are very specific guidelines through HRA that home base workers have to um, look to. And sometimes they can get very confusing information from HRA. And so generally what we do when somebody's denied a voucher or told they can't have it is speak with the head of that area in home base. Let's say it's the Bronx, it's Bronx Works. We speak with the, the administrators there and say, hey, is there any way we can push to really get a voucher? In this case, we think that they qualify for this reason. So if, if that is the case, you can always refer them to us if you think they're unfairly being denied a voucher. Um, again, undocumented families can apply for ERAP. Um, before March 2020, arrears, firstly, um, when they go to housing court, their lawyer will break up any uh, rental, you know, any rental arrears demands in the petition um, by pre-COVID and during COVID money. They likely have to wait to apply for a one-shot deal for the pre-March 2020 money, but they should talk to home base. Um, there's a question about a high school student currently living in a shelter without his parents who wants more stable housing. I would recommend the caseworker at that site help them find housing because that's their job. Uh, and if you're having trouble meeting with the caseworker, I would ask that the teen get the information themselves and have you call and say, what are you doing to help this teen get into better housing? Adrian, do you have anything to add to that? I don't, I haven't had a ton of, um, but also we have a wonderful program at NILAG, uh, Deb Berkman and the Public Benefits Unit help uh, a lot with uh, homelessness rights. And so if you have an issue there, you can refer it to NILAG's P Public Benefits Unit. Um, if a resident, and I'm guessing you mean NYCHA, puts in a ticket for a housing issue, but they forget their ticket number, they can call the customer contact center back and they can give them the ticket number. Likely the ticket is closed by that point because NYCHA likes to play that fun little game. Um, they also can apply for the uh, night the ticket on the My NYCHA app, which Adrian mentioned is probably the best way to do it so that you can keep track. Um, I know that there's a lot of seniors who aren't able to use that, but it is the best way to keep track of everything. Um, uh, Victoria mentioned that she works at a drug and alcohol facility and have people who go back to the girls homeless. Any suggestions if they don't wanna go back to their area I'm guessing that they were given a voucher to go to that area. That's a very common problem. Um, I would do advocacy to try and to find them another apartment that takes the voucher. If that's what they have, if it's NYCHA, ask them for a transfer. We do advise that transfers from NYCHA take years, especially in these situations. But I do, I do feel sympathetic for individuals who are put back into the neighborhoods 
um, whereby they, they, they have trauma or were arrested, et cetera. Uh, EHV, I think you're talking about a housing voucher. Um, yeah, Juanita, there are housing vouchers for teens. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but um, they can be very effective. There's not a lot of housing vouchers left through Section 8. So um, there is a person asking about a, a, a expired city FEPS voucher that, um, and they left the shelter. Um, I would go to the home base. So they're technically living right now. They left the shelter and they have a letter from psychiatrist documenting they have PTSD. Um, they have to go to a home base to get a new shopping letter. So wherever they are, if they're couch surfing or, you know, whatever zip code, I would, in this case, I would probably contact a head person at home base um, to say this person needs their shopping letter to be extended. Um, that way that they can keep going and finding an apartment. Um, if anybody's from home base here who wants to hop in on that, that's great. A reminder that I'm just looking at the Q&A. So if you're putting questions in the chat, you have to put them in the Q&A. Um, and a website, we can find the home base programs. Yes, I can put it in the chat. Um, I'm just not Xing out of this because I'm worried about losing everything. <laughs> um, so I can put it in the chat, but also I'm sure Harmony and others will send out the home base zip code. Um, yeah, if they're on the street and I know they don't want to go back to the shelter, I understand that. However, they do have to go to a home base to get an extended, uh, another city voucher um, shopping letter. And can Project Parachute help undocumented families get placed in an apartment? Listen, this is, and Adrian will hear me talk about this all the time, but there's just no real good program in New York City to help people find housing. And it's like, vein of our existence, I look to you all like social workers that are amazing social workers and care coordinators who somehow find people housing against all odds. Um, but I will say that if a person is having trouble getting into an apartment with a voucher because they're denying them based on the voucher, this is a serious problem. Um, Unlock NYC is a great program that helps people identify if they are being denied uh, housing based on their voucher. It's called income discrimination. And so uh, we're gonna get a little bit more into that probably in the next training, but um, they, there's no one place that helps people find housing, which is a big problem. Yeah, and that's why one of our goals is to keep people in their apartments. So sometimes people's first response will be, you know, I'm just gonna leave, the conditions are bad, or my landlord's harassing me. We try where possible to help them exit, um, to help them you, uh, activate their rights so that they can stay because really once they decide to leave those protections are gone there's just not as much protection once they make that decision to leave the apartment of their own volition exactly thank you adrian again do not self-evict even if you're being harassed undocumented tenants feel very vulnerable adrian and i have spent the last 20 months on the phone with people not being able to look them in the eye and tell them this at least adrian can speak spanish so she has a brand on that but telling them please don't leave your apartment because you're behind in rent just because you're undocumented someone asked if uh, housing vouchers are available for undocumented homeless tenants and this is what adrian's talking about don't leave a place and go to a shelter um, because you think that you're going to be evicted wait for the proper procedures because unfortunately unless if you're alone and undocumented the government cannot aid you. This is against the rules like of HRA, of federal subsidies to give money to undocumented individuals. Now, if you have a mixed status household, and we're going to discuss this, um, and by the way, the, an evaluation poll is coming out right now. Uh, please share your thoughts, honestly. Um, but again, if the housing uh, voucher is in a mixed status household, meaning there's a child who's a citizen and a parent who is not a citizen, they can possibly get a FEPS or city FEPS voucher. And we're gonna take up in the next training public charge very heavily, which means immigrants who've been scared out of their wits not to apply for benefits during the Trump administration. Um, and we're gonna talk about how it's important to, to you know, tell them that it doesn't apply to them. Many of these things, when they have citizen children, they have to apply for the benefits for the children because they're citizens. It's their right to have these benefits and it doesn't affect the parent. Very, 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 very few benefits affect the parent. Please come to our next training on that question. Um, really excellent questions. Adrian, anything I'm missing? Ooh, I've got more.
So um, legal health referrals, great question. It, so for instance, Adrian's at Amherst and Mount Sinai, I'm at Jacobia and Montefiore. So you would identify if a patient is being affected uh, health-wise in their housing due to the conditions, or if they are vulnerable to eviction due to a disability or immunocompromised, find out where they are seen for their disability and their health issues. So for instance, if they are seen at Elmhurst, they're going to get a legal referral to Adrian. So they should have their social worker call the legal referral uh, hotline for that particular hospital. Um, would there have to be a history of 301 reports for submitting the referral? No, I mean, we can help them talk to uh, the landlord and then submit the 301 reports. But if you can help them do that as well, which is what we're hoping you took away from this presentation, which is how to empower the tenant to go out there and, and pr pr prove that they have the right to habitable housing, to stay in their housing as long as um, you know they haven't been brought to court. And hopefully you can tell them all these things that we've given you the, the, um, the knowledge to empower them with that. Um, is HRA still reviewing applications for HRA supportive housing? That I think we had, they had a presentation, I think on supportive housing, Harmony and Tess and Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, about a year ago. So that I'm gonna defer to. <laughs> the experts on supportive housing. I think they are, but I'm not gonna. Adrian, I don't know if you know the answer to that, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry about that. But there was a presentation I know in Brooklyn Health and Housing Consortium on supportive housing, I think. Um, uh, There's a on about, um, and this does come up where if the landlord doesn't agree with ERAP or doesn't wanna cooperate. Um, so we do see this happening where once the tenant applies, um, OTADA will ask for certain documents or proof from the landlord if they don't cooperate or if they don't want to take the rent, then it's a defense in housing court. So the, the tenant should go ahead and apply, have the application number, provide proof that they did submit the application, and then it'll be up to the judge to figure out how to handle that case. But there's really, you can't force the landlord to comply, but it's you know, definitely in their interest and it won't look good to the judge if they refuse to take that money that's possibly available to them. Great. And again, the e-representation that Tess put in the chat is great for that. Um, someone asked about the flooding. Adrian and I especially have been working with a lot of families in after Ida because of the basement apartments that we represent a lot of tenants in. It's been really horrendous, just getting sick, so much sickness due to sewage uh, leaking in the apartments. The big thing that we tell people is to apply is to get FEMA assistance. Um, we're seeing a lot of pushback from small landlords saying, you get the FEMA assistance. No, you get the FEMA assistance. So it's always good if there's a health related issue to refer to us, but also to call 311 and ask for a tenant's rights uh, advocate to speak about how to apply for FEMA benefits. Um, that's what we're hearing from HRA. And I know that some people are still displaced. So if they're still displaced and the landlord is not helping them with that, it's something that you know a lawyer can help and intervene. Um, can a landlord demand outstanding payment from a tenant even though the outstanding payment is due by the Section 8? No, they can try. <laughs> they can go to court and sue for that money and the judge will just sever those arrears. That a, a tenant does not have the duty to pay what is owed by a third party. That's like pretty basic. So um, if that's an issue, then it's an issue between Section 8 and the landlord. Um, Two bedroom instead of a one bedroom for a home-based voucher. It really depends on the voucher. Um, it, it doesn't really matter about bedrooms. It's not like section eight where you have to have a specific bedroom size. Um, it's really a matter of how many people are in the house. Uh, so if there's another person who can, be, can want to put more information about that in the chat, it's home-based vouchers are very, and they're not home-based vouchers, they're HRA vouchers. City FEPS and FEPS vouchers are very different than section eight vouchers, but they have just raised the amount of money they're available to pay up to section eight levels, uh, which is great. Um, so if for instance, the studio, they'll now pay 1900 for a studio. Um, what about tenants who are legal residents somewhat compromised with other issues other than COVID? I'm guessing you're asking what they should do. They sh if they're behind in rent, they should apply for ERAP. If they're behind in rent and uh, have immunocompromised, um, they should ha submit a hardship declaration. Um, and they shouldn't leave their apartments and go into a shelter just because they're behind in rent. I don't, the safety clinic, I don't know what that is at Bellevue. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what that is. Um, so the referral is dependent on as well. Yeah, so in legal health at least, there are many legal services in the city. Adrian used to work at Lisney, I used to work at 
legal aid. There's we're lousy with housing attorneys in the city, which is amazing because right to counsel is a thing now. Legal health is a we look for a nexus between health and the legal issue, and we try to complement medical care with legal care. So that's why it's based on a referral to the hospital for if you want to see me or Adrian, um, or the 20 other advocates that we have throughout the city. Um, if a tenant who submitted an ERAP application is waiting for the landlord to fill out their portion, this is very typical. This is why ERAP is taking so long. Um, the only thing they can do is submit their application number and, and, and their date of birth to their to their landlord and wait, which is unfortunate. Um, if they have more questions, they can always call the helpline, uh, which is provided in the link that we put in this presentation. Um, it, the, if a person is living in housing and there there's a lot of people in the housing and they call through and one, it's always possible that something could happen where uh, there is a vacate order, but it's probably very unlikely. There's a lot of overcrowding in the city and there's just too much for 311 to really, if there was a situation with a lot of children and you know, maybe a, a mandatory reporter came in a house uh, and they're, you know, they shouldn't be called, they shouldn't be scared to call 311 though, because the amount of people living in the apartment. This is New York. We have a lot of people living together and over and over under, you know, so just tell them like, if they, they need to get these things done, they can also speak with an attorney about their rights. Um, and one of the things shouldn't be worried about how many people are in the apartment. Uh, lower middle income, I'm guessing you mean for ERAP. It there are specific guidelines for how much, but they should still apply for it. And if they're denied, they'll give them a reason for their denial. Okay, I think that was the end of the q and A. I don't know. Yeah, they should inquire at their respective home base about Fasten and Project Parachute. Hope I didn't miss anything. Thank you so much, Simone. And I apologize to folks, there were so many questions here and I, we did not get to all of them. We will definitely share the presentation um, and the slides with everybody via email. Um, before we go, um, first, super uh, huge thanks to Simone and Adrienne from um, Legal Health. It's a really overwhelming sort of situation with housing right now. And I know folks are really struggling to figure out how best to help their clients and patients. Um, so this information is really um, helpful. Um, I did want to put a plug in for our two upcoming trainings with Legal Health. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we already put those um, links into the chat box. We'll send them out again um, when we follow up with the slides uh, and the recording. Um, and then um, Bonnie, our executive director of the Health and Housing Consortium, I think she wanted to also um, put a plug in for our annual survey. Yes, thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, just quickly wanted to let you know that the Health and Housing Consortium is conducting our first annual survey to get feedback from those of you who attend our events, who are engaged with us um, around what you value, what else we could be doing, what are the challenges you're experiencing on the ground, and those of your clients or patients, so that we can um, help inform our programming for next year. So we're going to be including the link in the chat. It'll also go out in the follow-up email um, as an incentive. The survey takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, five people who respond to the survey will be randomly selected for a $20 gift card to Target. And the organization that has the most respondents will win free membership for 2022. So um, some great perks. Um, we really do value your input and want to make sure that we're meeting your needs. So please do fill out that survey. Thanks very much. Hand it back to you, Amy. I think that's it. Um, so thank you, everyone. If you have any, um, you know, follow up questions, um, you can reach out to us, um, either Carmi or myself or Bonnie or Tess at the Health and Housing Consortium, and we'll do our best to put you uh, in touch with folks who can answer your questions. Um, and if you do feel like we need another one of these sessions, um, please also let us know in the evaluation and, um, you know, we can work with legal health to, to have a follow-up. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a fast moving target 
the housing and, and rental assistance landscape right now. So it is kind of hard to, to stay on top of things. So thank you so much. I hope you'll join us for um, uh, our follow-up uh, trainings. In the next one is in two weeks on um, maximizing income uh, security. Is that right? Um, somebody said they missed the survey part. Um, I think if you just look at the link a little further up in the chat box, there's an open-ended survey where you can let us know about any um, topics you'd be interested in, in hearing about. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you again, Simone and Adrian and Harmony. Thanks for having us. Tess and Bonnie, um, we hope awesome. to see you all in a couple of weeks. Thank you.